My dad's good friend growing up was a guy named Jeff Harrison. And if there could be any two different people, Jeff Harrison and my dad were definitely two different kinds of people. On one hand, my dad was quiet and kind of to himself, more of an engineer kind of mind. And Jeff Harrison was gregarious and out loud. Their jobs were different too. Jeff was a computer programmer, pocket protector kind of guy, screwdriver with that does a little dip switches for those of you who are old school right here, in his pocket. My dad, my dad worked in manufacturing and in engineering. One of the things that they both had in common, though, is they were, really, they were really into helping kids prepare for the future. There were several of those guys, and, and they got together, and, and this is back, okay, in the 80s, right? So a lot of you guys don't even remember the 80s. Some of you were there with me. Um, computers were this brand new thing, right? How many of you remember when we had floppy disks for computers? And, uh, I, you, we are all old people, all right? But for those of you who are younger, let me explain that initially when computers were designed, they didn't have a hard drive. They had these things literally, floppy disks, right? It's like five and a quarter, flop, 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 floppy sort of thing. You shoved it into the computer, and, and, and it would ask you for like a series of these things. All right, you've got to put this one in, and then pull out and put this three, rah, 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 rah. now put out this four. Rah, rah, rah. Eventually, the program would all load into the like 16 kilobytes of memory the computer had, and then you were in like Flint. And uh, my, my dad and Jeff realized that the computer thing was coming big time. My dad was working on a project where they were building or putting robots in, in the manufacturing process, and Jeff worked for IBM, and so they decided it would be a marvelous idea if they would take one night a week, rent the local high school computer lab, and teach a bunch of 12, 13, 14-year-old boys how to program computers. Now, I don't know why these guys thought this was a good idea, but here we all came, excited to learn how to program a computer, and Jeff had wrote it all out on the board. Now, what you do is, and all I can remember about that whole process is, is I realized fairly quickly that this this is not my thing. Now, some of you guys went to school for computer programming, and that's awesome. Right? But for those of you who have never even set foot in this subject, let me just tell you quickly how this kind of works. You type for weeks, literally weeks, thousands of lines of code, H line, this, V line, that, this, some, pick up this bit of information. And then there comes a moment of truth. My first computer program was this game that was supposed to be a, an ape and he would throw a rock and you would try to throw a rock and hit the, the, uh, the lion. And if you didn't hit the lion, then the lion could attack you. There was no graphics here, guys. We just had like words that said dead, you know? Uh, it's a very basic game, but still it was like 1,500 lines of code to make this thing work. And finally, you get that last one typed in. And I'm not, wasn't a great typer in those days. And my mind is blown because my little ADD head is wanting to explode and then you run the program, run. And you get back this answer, syntax error. On Apple IIgs, it was accompanied by an uh, sound, syntax error. That means that somewhere in the 1,500 lines of code previous to that, you typed a colon where you should have done something else or you forgot a period or you had a space and then you had to go back and find it. Nowadays, they have computer programs that do that for you. But in those days, nay, nay, you had to do that. And of course, my dad, being a good father, did not want to raise a quitter, so we must find the problem, right? Right? Jeff had this saying that he would tell us every week before things started. Boys, remember this. Garbage in, garbage out. I guess that was a thing that computer programmers said in that day. But what he meant was that if you don't get the data entered correctly, you won't get the outcome that you desire. Last week, we started a sermon series that we're calling Mastermind. And in that series, we, we took a look at how do we begin to have the mind of Christ how do we begin to think like Jesus thought? And I think that intellectually this morning, all of us know that that's really the idea that we should, we should think about the world. We should see the world the way Jesus saw the world. And, and we, we like the idea and we're for it. But how in the world do you do it? Because a lot of us have, have tried. And we've typed in those lines of programming. We've remembered, remembered, memorized those texts of scripture. And then we applied something in the world and there was that syntax error, that haunting, uh -uh. and we realized we got something wrong. And it's really easy in that moment to just stop. But we remember 
the words of Paul in Romans, the 12th chapter in verse two, where he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God's intention was not for us to necessarily have it easy, but God's intention also was not that we would quit. God wanted us to get up and to try again. The problem is, is that I think most of us realize that we're just, we're just not naturally good at doing this stuff, right? Like some of you guys probably made a New Year's resolution. I want to be nicer person this year. And just as soon as you make a New Year's resolution, like I want to be a nicer person, you just know that something's going to happen that makes you want to yell at somebody. That's just how it works. Or, or you say, you know what? I'm, we're going to save money. As soon as you, you say you're going to save money, you can almost guarantee that things are going to break. Um, people are going to ask for money. Unexpected expenses just flow in through the mailbox like ri uh, water in a river. Or may maybe you said, you know what? I want to trust God more in 2024. But those old habits of worry, those anxieties, those challenges, those people, those situations, they derail us. And I think we all know what that feels like. We know that Jeff's old saying of garbage in, garbage out is true. And yet it's almost inevitable that at some point, if you live long enough, there's going to be some things that just aren't right in the mix. Why? Because human beings are kind of naturally irrational. I don't mean to be disrespectful to you this morning, but most of us in the room today have a wire or two crossed this is what I mean. When you're a little kid, there's this beautiful thing. When, when, God, when God created us, he created our minds as we come into the world as kind of a blank canvas, right? And, and, and when those little eyes begin to kind of take in the world, we have a bunch of little kids running around here at church, and I love that stage because they are just sucking everything in like a mental vacuum sweeper, right? You have to be really, really careful. I was with, I was with a, a friend of mine the other day, and I was playing an old Striper song, and, uh, and, and he said uh, he didn't know what the band Striper was, and if you don't, that's fine too. Um, but it's, it's like an old Christian rock band, but it starts off, it sounds like an 80s rock band, and he's like, they're not going to say anything that I don't want my son to hear, right? And I'm like, no, no, it's a Jesus man. But the thing is, is that, is that he knew what we know, and that is they're just sucking stuff in, and everything they hear, they say. That's because, because as a baby, one of their earliest things, they, they, they look and they smile at mom or dad. And of course, parents and grandparents, we love it when our babies smile at us. And so we smile back, oh, cutesy, cutesy, you're so sweet, goo, 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 baby, right? And the baby smiles back to us again. And in their little mind, although it's not really that formed, they got an idea of smile good. Or, or, or if you think about maybe a little bit later, they're toddling around the house, right? And you're maybe, maybe cooking something in the oven or the stove is hot and you tell them, no, the stove is hot. But then they do like Jason did. I don't know if you guys are like me. And they have to reach out and touch it and find out for themselves and it burns their hand. Ah, right? Sto hot stove, bad, right? That just burned into their head. The brain begins to develop these beautiful neural pathways and that's gonna help them grow up. They're gonna be able to be much more efficient adults when they don't have to automatically every time or when they don't have to manually recognize that the stove is hot and that smiling people are good. But here's the problem. Suppose that baby wants a sucker, but mom says, no, you can't have a sucker. And the baby's like, Jason <laughs> gets upset because it wants something sweet. And so baby cries and then mom gives a sucker. Now before, when mama smiled, baby smiled, smiling good. Mom says, stove's hot, baby touches stove, stove hot, stove bad. But now we have crossed information. Mom said no, I cried, mom gave me what I wanted. I'm not here this morning to talk about parenting because believe you me, if you're a parent right now and you're like, I do that, so did all of us, okay? All right? But I am telling you this morning quickly that it's really important, and as you become an older parent, as a grandparent, they'll tell you it's really important to be consistent because when we have those inconsistent messages, they cross wires in those neural pathways. Our brain says, if I'm told no and I whine about it, I may get told yes. And that's where the problem begins to erupt for us as humans because we are broken people living in a broken world. 
And as youngsters, we're naturally selfish and we're quick to leverage every situation to our, old, our own advantage. But now, now we're adults. Now we're people that are trying to grow into the image and to the shape and have the mindset of Jesus Christ. And we talked about this verse last week that was written to the church in Corinth, a church that certainly had several wires crossed in their understanding of morality and relationships and unity, right? And Paul writes back in 2 Corinthians and he says to them, for though we live in a, the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of this world. And we said last week, that's because the weapons of this world are designed to break and to make people submit. Look, all of us have things that are broken. I do, you do. We all have wires that are crossed. We all have paths that need to be straightened. And you can do that a couple different ways. You can force people to. Some of you know what that's like. You've had that happen to you as a child, and sometimes it's appropriate to rewire that by force. But oftentimes, if you have the personality that many and maybe most of us have, even though you may in the moment choose to do what the other person asks you to do, deep down inside, you're still convinced that your way is right. And when given the first chance, you will go back to the way that seems right to you. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man and in the end, it ends in death. God is trying to do something very, very different and Paul explains that. We're fighting a war, but we're not using conventional weapons. No, in fact, he says, on the contrary, to the exact opposite of that, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. God's power to rewire how our minds think and take in this world. And as he finishes, he says, and to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. The greatest challenge possibly that there is in the entire Bible, maybe in the entire world, is to take every thought that passes through this mind and make sure that it is obedient, that it's in the shape, that we're reacting to it in the way that Jesus would react. That is a lifelong commission. That is a lifelong challenge. All of us, no matter where we are this morning, are somewhere in that process. But remember this, that our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. What comes into your mind will eventually come out of your life and we cannot have a positive life if we have a negative mind. And I think we've seen a lot of examples of that. This morning, I'm here to say that if we do not gain control of what we think, we will never gain control of what we do. And I think that's for a lot of us where the breakdown happens. At the beginning of a year, we're like, no, this year I'm gonna do things differently, all right? I'm gonna lose weight or I'm gonna save money or I'm gonna be a kinder person or I'm gonna be more consistent in my Bible study or whatever good things that you have planned to do in this year. But the reality is that if you don't change your mind first, you will never change your actions. And so we find ourselves year after year kind of falling back into the same old paths doing the same old habits, saying the same old things, reacting in the same old ways. You know why? Because at some point in your life, your brain wrote a neural pathway and it may not be a good one. The wires might be crossed, but it's comfortable. This morning, I'm here to challenge you that it's worth the effort and pain and struggle to change. Not just because your life will be better here, but God has called and challenged us to do so. Regardless of your age, your brain is desiring something from you, and that is that you train it. And just like we train our physical bodies, it's not just about what we're doing with it, but it's what we're putting into it. And, and if you don't train your mind, if you're not deliberate, not purposeful about, about how you're shaping your thought process, Satan and the world around us will have plenty of opportunities to dump all kinds of trash into your life quite by accident. Most of us have a device in our pocket this morning that you can grab and pick up. And within three seconds or five seconds, you can be sucked into something that's training your brain and maybe not training your brain in the way you want it to be. So it leads us to our text this morning in Philippians, the fourth chapter, in verse number eight. It's a passage that undoubtedly you guys have heard many times before. But Paul says this, finally, brothers, whatsoever things are true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, 
Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything that is excellent, if anything that is worthy of praise, think on these things. This is probably one of the most encouraging passages of Scripture in the New Testament. Apostle Paul said, hey, look around your world today and begin a sorting process. Look for the things in your life that are true, that are honorable, that are just, that are pure, that are lovely, that are commendable. Look for things that are excellent. Look for things that are worthy of praise and focus your mind and your attention on those things. Maybe I should give you a little context this morning because it's easy for me and maybe for you to write this off and say, oh, that's the Apostle Paul and he's an apostle of Jesus and he had it easy. When Paul is writing this letter back to the church in Philippi, Paul himself is a prisoner in chains. Paul could have just as easily said, God has let me down. Paul could have said, I can't go on. Paul could have said, life can't get worse. But rather than that, that's what I would do. That may be what you do. But what he does is said, hey guys, I want to share with you what I do. What I do is I focus on things that are true and honorable, things that are just and pure, things that are lovely, things that are commendable, things that have excellence and are worthy of praise. Because Paul knows, like we know, that our minds desperately want to be trained. And how we train it, what we provide it with, shapes not only how we feel in the moment, but how we live our life in the future. I don't know if you guys were like me, but I learned most of my Bible verses in the King James Version because I'm from the 80s, right? So uh, that's all we had until the early 80s. And um, I remember memorized this verse in a little bit different way. It started off whatsoever things, right? And it finished like this. If there is any virtue, if there is anything that is praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I know that meditate and think are kind of fundamentally the same word, but I don't think we look at them the same. Now, I know a lot of us might say, well, Jason, meditate. You know, that's like the Eastern people, the long bearded guy that's sitting on top of a mountain with his arms and his legs crossed and the wind's blowing and his mind is empty and clear of all things. That is indeed a form of Eastern religion meditation, but that's not That's not Christian meditation. Christian meditation is an active mind, a mind that's filled with truth, a mind that is focused on Jesus Christ. And all throughout scripture, that idea of meditation has been something that's been kind of kind of pushed forward. David, probably one of the most introspective and maybe one of the more intellectual writers in the Old Testament, wrote a lot about this in the book of Psalms. He said in Psalms 119, I meditate on your precepts, I consider your ways. Later on in Psalm 143, he says that I meditate on all your works and I consider what your hands have done. What does David mean? What do I mean this morning when I talk about meditation? Years ago, I read a book. Um, I read several books, but I read a book named Move and it was a a group of guys that went out and they interviewed about a thousand churches and they asked them a lot of questions, mainly, what do you think is the most effective things you can do to key and to help people grow spiritually. And I just want to read a paragraph from this book that I never really forgot. After having interviewed about a thousand church leaders and gone through about a thousand successful churches, this is their conclusion. Nothing has a greater impact on the spiritual growth than reflection on scripture. If churches could do only one thing to help people at all levels of spiritual maturity grow in their relationship with Christ, their choice is clear. They would inspire, they would encourage, and equip their people to reflect on Scripture for meaning in their lives. Guys, I think we forget that we have probably, uh, without question, the most valuable tool Most of us have on average two and a half of them in our houses with us every day. But a lot of the problem is, is that how we approach reading the scripture, we we, we sometimes just kind of like read it to read it. All right, I've never read this, so I'm going to read this. I'm going to get into this. I'm going to force it. I'm going to read the words. But the word meditation or thinking indicates that we do more than just read the words. I think we all know that you can read something and never really understand or comprehend what it is that you're reading. And in reality, though, in this room this morning, there's 
a lot of us that are on all different spectrums of the, of the scale of comprehension. Some of us read something once and we automatically comprehend fully what it was about and we can apply that in our lives. But many of us, especially on things that involve our heart, our emotions and our life experiences, it requires that we, that we take it in over and over and over again. To meditate on God's word is to think it over, to reflect on it, to ponder on it, to dwell on it, to spend enough time in God's word until you recognize that God is speaking to you personally. I'll admit to you this morning that when I graduated from high school and I went into Bible college in 1994, I struggled with my belief in God. And people would step back and they would say later, I don't understand how that's true, Jason, because I heard you preach, I heard you teach. And I'll tell you this morning how it was true. Because when I approached the scripture, when I opened the word of God, I looked for the things that other people needed. If I was gonna to talk to a group of young students at a, at, a, at a youth rally or a youth conference or something like that, I would, I would know, what do young students need? Well, they need, they need to know about sexual purity and they need to know about priorities in life and they need to know about work ethic and they need, to, and those are all true things, right? I think we all recognize that when we're in our high school years, there's a lot of pressure in our culture and in probably all the cultures since the beginning of time to not be sexually pure. There's, there's a challenge for us to maybe just kind of coast with things and be lazy to not put God God's priority is our priority in life. Those are all good things. But here's the problem. I was studying the word of God to fix other people's problems before I fixed my own. Jesus said, remove the plank from your own eye, then you will be able to see clearly to remove the plank from another's eye or the speck from another person's eye. We need to study the word of God enough that it gets into our mind enough that we recognize that God is speaking to us. Not to the broken world out there, not to that person that's sitting in a chair next to you in church on Sunday or that person that you saw their comment on Facebook last week, but to you, to me. This is a personal message to Jason Quarter, to you first. It's a funny thing, but when you think about it like that, you begin to think, well, what did it mean to the original people that heard it? What do you think the author really meant when he wrote this? Not what do I want the author to mean, but what did that author really mean? What does the original language really say? That's meditation. We begin to ask the Holy Spirit, why, why this verse today, Lord? Or why is this thing burning a hole in my heart? Why do I feel guilty when I read this passage of scripture? Then this really cool thing begins to happen. If you're like me, you take that passage of scripture and you begin to kind of look in it and you re read it enough that you realize it's really about me, not about everyone else. I need this more than everyone else does probably. Then you begin to understand exactly what it says and then you come across the great challenge that most of us run into when we read the Bible. That is, we realize, I don't know how to do this. I mean, I get it. The Bible says that if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven, but how do I forgive? I get it that I need to put the, the priorities of God ahead of my own. And, and I understand that, that quitting and starting is a bad thing because Jesus said, no one who puts his hand at a plow and turns back is fit for the kingdom of God. But how do I do this? And if you're like me, it's just kind of natural to begin to have a conversation with the one who wrote the book. Say, Lord, I know that this is for me and I know I'm no good at it and I know I need to be better, but how do I do it? That's something that we call prayer. Not just a list of things that we mention, but an honest conversation about where we are in relationship to where God has called us to be. Guys, that only happens when we take time to really meditate or to think about the word of God. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, reminds us of this, and I believe this to be true. I'm sure you do as well, that the word of the Lord, word of God, is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. It cuts between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes the innermost thoughts and desires. You know, something else that happens 
point in our development. You who have raised kids, you've seen this. And even if you are a, just a, a high school person or maybe a college kid, I know you've witnessed this too because there's this point in time where, where kids are just kind of open books, right? They're like running around the house and you say, why did you do that? And they're like, I wanted to, right? <laughs> it's a beautiful thing at that point. Um, they're, they're kind of hiding. Their emotions are transparent. And if you know them a little bit, you know how to read them. But then it becomes this point of sophistication in life where we figure out, maybe I don't want people to actually know what I'm thinking. Because if people know exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing, then they may tell me I can't do it. And so then we become very good at hiding our natural intentions. Now we may look like we're all benevolent. I would love to help you with this project. But we know in the backside that we have something that we're getting for ourselves. Let me, let me assist you with this. I know exactly how you feel. But those are all covers for people who are after something. Now, as adults here today, we're hypersensitive to that because we live in that world, right? Someone calls you up and, and wants to talk with you and you don't know who they are. What do you think? telemarketer trying to get something from me, right? That's how we're wired to think. But guys, that sophistication, that dishonesty, that denial is dangerous. That's why we need the word of God because the word of God cuts through all of the clamor and it reveals to us our innermost thoughts and desires. What is it that we really think? And what is it that we really want? And here's the challenge. When you figure out what it is that you really think and what you really want, it's at that point that you realize you really need the book that helped you see it. It's easy for me and maybe for you to just kind of walk through life and think, I'm a pretty good person. But sometimes that's simply not true. And Paul says to the Colossian church, he says, hey, therefore, since you've been raised with Christ... Strive for things above. Since you've received this opportunity to be a Christian, you should push to become a better person where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. So that leads us this morning to the second thing that we're going to talk about as we wrap up our time together today. And how is it then that we set about to train our mind? So the first thing is that we need to meditate on the word of the Lord. And we need to kind of know where we are. And that's reality, right? If it's garbage in, garbage out, then we want to know where the garbage is so that we don't put it in. We need to be able to recognize the garbage. And sometimes that's harder than it thinks. We think because we have a few wires crossed and we're good at lying to ourselves. The word of God will help us see that. But how do, we, how do we train ourselves so that we can accomplish what it is that God has set about to, helping us, to, to, uh, to help us accomplish? I think the world has a way of getting all of us down. It fills us with distractions. It fills us with temptations, with entertainment. It promises us happiness, and it very seldom ever delivers on those things. And perhaps you know what it's like and can identify today what it feels like to be weighted down when you look at this state of affairs in the world. It seems like things were rough and in a lot of ways they just seem to be getting rougher. And people are almost slipping in our world into kind of a state of despair. You know, a few years ago we, we had opposing ideas and we were animated on who was going to lead us out of the darkness and I think some of us were suspicious that anyone could but now most people think the mess is bigger than what we, anyone can sort out. We're overwhelmed by the corruption and by the confusion that surrounds us every day. Our responsibilities just become kind of ho-hum and drum. They're almost a burden. When we focus on these earthly things, the tragic consequence of that is that our eyes begin to slip from things above to the things below. Now, I'm not saying that we need to live oblivious to the world in which we live in, but Jesus also told us to not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have enough trouble of its own. Live one day at a time. So how do we begin to train our minds to focus on the right things? Because focus is a skill. 
When the Bible says to meditate on the word of God, right? When it says, when Paul says to focus on these things and he lists a whole group of very positive and good things, some of us are like, that's great, but how do I get to that place? How do I learn to focus? I'm gonna share quickly three things this morning that I think can help all of us to begin to focus on the things that really matter. Number one is that we need to learn that focus is knowing the goal. It's important to define words sometimes. And I think that defining focus in this way helps us to understand it. What is the goal of life? Now, I'm not talking this morning specifically about your personal goals. Every one of us in this room have very different personal goals. Some of you are in high school or in junior high right now, and you just want to graduate high school and go to college. Some of you are married, and maybe you want to have children. Some of you are, have career advancement ideas. Some of us have grew up in the 80s, and so we have kids, and we've gotten married, a lot of us, and maybe we're looking forward to, to the future. Those personal goals are all very different, but there is one goal that as followers of Jesus Christ unites us. And in reality, it's the most important goal. It's the goal that Jesus left us right before he left the world when he said, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. The goal of life has already been set for us. It was the goal that was set in the garden when God said to Satan, you will bruise his heel, he will crush your head. It's the goal that was reiterated in Revelation 22 when John looked and saw all the nations of the earth gathered and all the faithful gathered there. The goal, the greatest goal of all of history is that lost people might find a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the good news, that we might reach and make disciples. Some of you guys probably watched a movie that, that I did, if you're from the 80s called The Karate Kid, all right? How many of you have seen The Karate Kid? Great movie, right? <laughs> wax on, wax on. And there's a lot of lines in that movie that's good stuff. But my favorite that a friend of mine would always quote to me, a teacher that was a friend of mine, would always quote to me was this, where, uh, where uh, and someone pointed out this to me that I, I had mentioned that the great theologian Jackie Chan, but that was a remake movie for this, for those of you who are movie buffs. But uh, when, when the instructor says to his student, your focus needs more focus. You guys remember that line right there? Your focus needs more focus. And then they're, they're, they're doing a whole set of exercises to increase his focus. That was actually a really positive and smart comment for Jason Quarter, but I think it's very true for us today. Church family, our focus needs more focus. We've forgotten what it is that we were called to do and why we are here we're not here to be happy. We're not here to be successful in this world. We're not here to acquire a lot of comfortable possessions. We are here to make disciples. That's why we're here. I don't care who you are in this room this morning. Some of you guys might have 50, 60, 80 more years to live. Some of you might have eight months to live. But if you're here this morning and you're alive, which I hope all of you are, um, you have a mission. Until the very end of your life, we have an opportunity to reach lost people for Jesus Christ. One of the themes that comes up in a lot of movies is that hero that is down, but not out, right? I mean, he looks like he's dead. He's lying in the mud. He's been blundering by the enemy. And then you see the music begins to, to build and the camera pans back over the hero as he picks himself out of the mud and he wins the battle. I think we love that story because it's written into our hearts. God is saying, as long as you have life, you have an opportunity to do something with it, not just to sit on the couch and watch television until your day comes. Focus is knowing the goal. And guys, I think that some of us just need to Focus on our focus. We need to realize that God has given us this awesome opportunity to be a part of something we don't deserve and to move forward with it. The second thing I want to talk about is that, that, that perseverance is our setting of mind. It, it's, it's putting our mind to something. In the Old Testament, there's this great story about how the children of Israel return after 70 years to the land of Israel. And they, they show up in Jerusalem and the whole city's been leveled and it's a pile of rubble. And they just kind of move into the rubble. And they're just sitting there in the middle of this mess until God sends a prophet back. And that prophet goes back and he says, hey guys, we're gonna rebuild this city wall. 
And there's a line in that text that I love. And it said, the people had a mind to build. And you know what happened? (laughs) They completed a project that had not been dealt with for years in a little over a month because they had a mind. They had put their mind to doing something. Perseverance is setting our mind. In fact, Paul says this in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's the reality, isn't it, guys, that sometimes life can just drag us down and we can just say, you know what, I'm tired and I just want a break and I just want to let the younger people do it or, or I just, that's a job for the older people. The older people need to do that or, or we'll let the staff at the church handle that. Listen, guys, it's not the old people's job. It's not the young people's job. It's not staff that leads a church job. It's our job. It's our responsibility. We have this opportunity. God has laid in your hands, not mine alone, your hands the opportunity to make this world a better place to help people understand that the truth that you hold and know will give them the joy and peace that they so desperately desire. The last one as we close is simply this, that encouragement pushes us. I don't think we can over exaggerate the importance of encouragement. You know why that little baby thinks smiling is good? Because when that little baby smiles at mama and mama smiles back, they're encouraged. I'll bet you know what it's like when somebody comes up, maybe someone you don't know, and they, they just tell you something, maybe very simple, that they appreciate that you did or an attribute about you. I'll bet right now some of you can remember some things that people said about you when you were a kid or last year. Because if there's one thing that is more powerful than the darkness and the discouragement of this world, it's encouragement. You guys would not believe how important genuine encouragement is to people. Again, in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the writer of Hebrews says, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. I think we probably know what that means. Make level the paths for your feet so that the lame might not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one can see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up and causes trouble and defiles many. We could preach a whole sermon about this, but our time has come and gone today. Let me just point out to you what he says right here. And he reminds us that we need to strengthen our feeble, weak, our, our feeble knees and, and, uh, and arms to make the path easier for other people to find what it is that we have found in Jesus Christ. That is one of the greatest goals of life is the opportunity to lead other people to Jesus. So seek encouragement by overcoming weaknesses. There's nothing more exciting for your brain than when you're successful in overcoming something that's been holding you back. Seek encouragement that comes from leaving nothing on the playing field, but giving everything 110% to a mission. Some of you remember that when you played ball before. Maybe you lost the game, but you know that you had done everything that you possibly could to ensure a victory. Seek encouragement from mentors and friendships. The Bible says that We shouldn't forsake the gathering of ourselves together as a habit of some, but encourage one another even more as you see the date approaching. And we need encouragement. I'm gonna tell a story I've told before, but as we close today, but it's one of my favorites because it's just one of those moments in my life that is maybe uh, one of the most powerful examples of encouragement. Years and years ago, I had uh, (laughs) gotten roped into a duathlon, and I don't know how many of you guys look at me today and see a duathlete, but if you do, uh, we need uh, we need to talk to you. Um, I am never have never been, nor will I ever be, an athletic kind of person. But a good friend of mine, Alvin, said, "Jason, I want to participate in this duathlon, and why don't you do it with me?" And I'd done these with Alvin before. We mostly done those like little, you know, little northern Minnesota kind of deals. No big deal. I said, "Where's this at?" He said, "It's the Apple Duathlon. It's down in in uh, in, in the in the southern part of of uh, Minnesota." He said, "It's going to be great, Jason." He said a lot of fun. I did it last year. I said, all right. 
So we, we show up at the event, and Michelle was probably the first one to catch on that we were way over our, uh, our experience level. Because there, as you walk in, I don't know if you've ever been around like elite class athletes, but they just carry themselves differently. They have like 2% body fat, you know. There's muscles that flex that you didn't even know you had. And I'm surrounded by people who are eating pasta, well, not eating pasta, because they don't eat that kind of thing, but it was a big spaghetti dinner. Everyone's getting ready for this big race, and I remember I said to Alvin, Alvin, I'm not sure that I'm up to this. Alvin said, don't worry, Jason. It's, it's a nice flat course. Okay. They changed the course, you know. And the day of the beginning of the race start, when they announced the course posting, Alvin had checked it early that morning. He said, it's a little hilly. All right. What he meant was, is it was a trip through the Alps in Minnesota. I mean, there were hills like this, followed by hills like this, followed by three more hills like this. And, and, and as, as Alvin makes his run, he comes back, he's kind of tired already, and he trades off the little deal that you take in a duathlon. And as I'm riding out, they announce my name. Here goes Jason Quarter and the team members. And I hear him announcing the lady that's coming behind me. And they knew this gal because she was one of those elite level athletes. And they said, hey, here comes so-and-so. I can't remember her name anymore. She just gave birth three weeks ago. Congratulations. I'm thinking in my mind, there's a lady who just gave birth behind me. I've got her beat. No, about a mile down the road, shoom, she goes by. I never see her again. By the end of that race, I'm just riding hill after hill. And the final hill of that race, I'm done. I'm done. My legs have turned into jelly. I push down and the bike doesn't go forward. I am just about to stall out. And if you've ever been there, if you get off, you're done for. All of a sudden, I felt something that normally would make me very nervous. Another human being had placed their hand on my bottom. And they were pushing. At this point, I'm happy to have any help. And so I just go with it. I start, keep on pedaling, and the hand just keeps pushing me. I thought maybe it was God. I didn't know. It pushed me up onto the top of the hill. I get up to the top of the hill. I go over the hill. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I get down on my arrow bars to begin to make that descent. The old man slaps me on the back, rides by and says, good luck, son. It's all downhill from here. He must have been 80 years old. Oh, my goodness. And I learned a valuable lesson that day. Age is a myth. We need 80 and 90 year old people that are slapping people on the back and saying, let's keep going. We need young people that says, hey, we've got a mission to do church. Let's get fired up. We need middle-aged people to say, you know what? My life is so busy. I can't fit another thing, but I will make time for the kingdom of heaven. We need that church. The world needs to see Jesus. It's time that we begin to think about these things. We're going to stand together and sing today. If you have a need, you know you can come. If you need to be baptized into Christ, you've never made that decision. The baptistry is full and it's ready. Let's not leave here today without making that decision. Let's sing together, family.